Uh, this is my first time in Maine, and I had a lobster roll, and I got to see the fort, and take a walk on the beach, and it was just really absolutely wonderful, especially this time of year. Uh, I am going, I'm a writer, I have an academic background, I have a restaurant background, I have done so many things, I've homeschooled my kids, I've, um, I've worked in diversity policy at the, at the system level in Wisconsin, so I've kind of done a lot of things, but uh, really my strongest passion has been around Palestine, and I want to tell you how that came to happen, because we all have our stories and our life journeys, and um, we never know where we're going to end up. So um, I'm going to start by giving you just a little bit of background about who I am and how I got to be where I am, and talk about where this journey has led me. And, of course, get into the Canaan Fair Trade connection and discuss, um, really, uh, hopefully, raise your spirits about some of the wonderful things that are actually happening on the ground over there that give a lot of people hope and, um, and allow us to kind of look forward to tomorrow in spite of all of the news and, and difficulties that we and others are facing. I actually grew up in Detroit, and I'm not too shy to tell you how old I am. I was born in 1967, and that was the same year that we had a rebellion in Detroit. I wasn't there that year, but our, my family moved there when I was very young. And so that's the context that I grew up in, in the city of Detroit. I went to Detroit Public Schools, and uh, my mom's first job was to, or her first assignment in, in the, working for the city of Detroit was to rename uh, 12th Street to Rosa Parks Boulevard because that's where the, the, what's known as the Detroit riots or what other people call the rebellion started. So I grew up in a place that, um, you know, where white flight had occurred and um, the, the city was very depressed and financially strapped. Um, you know, people were losing their jobs, uh, a lot of properties were damaged. And the future of the city was really in question. And that's, my mom was working for the city, and so that's where we had to live. And I basically grew up there. And the other thing that I really was aware of growing up there, besides how, uh, what color your skin is or where you live, really impacts the opportunities that you have and, um, you know, what you have access to. And so that became very clear to me as a child, even though I was the daughter of a professor and, and, a, and a you know a working woman working for the city, it was very clear to me how those um, how communities were marginalized and affected by what was happening. The other thing I was aware of is that we were living on native land. You know that there were people who lived there before, and and that really struck me as a child that I was living in a place where a community had been basically you know driven out and their way of life had been virtually destroyed, and so. That are pro those are probably the seeds that um, grew in me with time. Uh, when I left Detroit, I left to go study in Germany. German had my junior year abroad. I'm, my father is actually from Germany, so I'm the daughter of a German. Um, I, my studies were in international studies, and I was focusing on the Middle East, um, but also, of course, studied a lot about Germany. I very soon came to learn, obviously, with all my uh, studies, that, you know, my family was, not personally, but, you know, my grandfather's Germany was, was uh, responsible for the Holocaust, and, and that was something that I uh, carried with me as well. So when I was in Germany, I actually met a Palestinian who graciously invited me and my brother, who was also studying in Germany at the time, to visit his family in Gaza. So I had been studying about the Middle East, the war in Lebanon, it, this is the middle of the Cold War, and, um, and also had opportunities to go to East Germany through my father's profession. He was a professor of German. And so I had seen divided Germany and now had the opportunity to go see for myself on the ground this place called Israel and Palestine. And uh, fortunately, my father had a, a, a Jewish colleague whose daughter had recently immigrated to Israel through the law of return and uh, with her husband and two children and um, they invited me and my brother to come stay with them in Jerusalem where they lived and then uh, 
this other um, person that we knew in Germany, a student, invited us to visit his family in Gaza. So I very quickly had an intensive uh, experience of seeing, um, you know, kind of just in, at face value how an American family, a Jewish American family, could come and live in Israel just because they wanted to and, and get citizenship and get jobs and have a place to live and, uh, and live a, a really good life. And then I go to Gaza and, and witness a family that were actually refugees who hosted us in a, basically a one-room house with, you know, nine children and um, most of the house had no roof and, and it was a big, uh, it, you know, awakening for me to just in my body feel the difference between, you know, what kind of opportunities people have in that context. And of course it felt familiar in certain ways with what I had experienced growing up in Detroit. So, um, uh, Anyway, that, um, that experience of, of being, you know, I, I was interested in both sides. I was studying the issue, I was learning the history, but it made it very personal for me. And, and it touched me in a way that I, you know, obviously touched me very, very deeply. I continued to study the area, um, and I decided to learn Arabic and, uh, and do my master's in Middle Eastern studies. Um, when I did come back from Germany, I met my husband, who's Nasser Abu Farha, who's the, this, this is one of the big secrets, uh, the, um, the founder of Canaan Fair Trade, so I will get into, into that uh, history, but um, this just shows you kind of me being in a situation where I got to go behind the Iron Curtain, have first-hand experience with a wall, which of course Detroit had walls of sorts with Eight Mile Road and things like that. And I'm going to just skip that. So, um, <clears throat> so what I what I learned is this family in Gaza. They were from Jaffa. They were refugees, and they, they lived in Gaza and did not have the right to go live in Jaffa. Now there were some Palestinians in 1948, on the day that she was born, or the day after, um, who were able to stay in in areas. And so it was an education. Every Palestinian that I've met ever since. You know, you're not just Palestinian. You're either, you're either uh, like Cynthia, whose family came to the U.S. and she's been there once, and and you know some some people don't even have the the right to go back at all, depending on their status. The family I met were refugees, and so the 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 person that we knew studying in Germany was stateless and and was there to study out of the you know the generosity of the German government. And so, um, you know, I've, I've been, I've since, um, now Nasser's family, for example, did, did not have to leave where they left, where they lived. <coughs> and so they got to stay in their village and in their home in the West Bank. And so he's a, a you know, a resident of the West Bank, but not an Israeli citizen. And so they're all different, um, you know, Palestinians in Israel who are Israeli citizens. So this, this all became very confusing, but very eye-opening that you have all these different kinds of Palestinians um, who, you know, and some who were in Israel and actually ended up, um, uh, who, who ended up becoming citizens but, but were still not, their, their homes were still destroyed in, in 1948. Um, you know, so one of the, one of the experiences that I've had over, over the years, um, there was one year where I spent the whole year um, there with my two sons, and our oldest son is Canaan, and he was born the day before you, actually on the day that the State of Israel was declared. It was declared at 4 p.m., and he was born at 3.20, so it's pretty interesting how these things happen, but um, uh, I, w I was uh, headed, to, my kids were going to school at a, at a local school in, in a nearby town, and I was driving there, and uh, there was this one road that had two ways around to get to the school and the university where I was working. And um, one day I got there and the, there was a long line, of, long, long line of cars and there were soldiers and it was clear that, you know, nobody was moving. And I, would, you know, I needed to get to work and so I got out of my car and I walked up you know, to the soldiers, and, and you know, I see all these Palestinians looking at me, walking up to the checkpoint, um, and I just said, you know, what's going on? And they said, sorry, the road's closed, you're, you're going to have to go back. And 
And I said, well, I, I can. I have to get to work. I have, actually have a meeting in 10 minutes. And, and I could see, you know, I could see the school and the university right on the hill. And, and he said, I'm sorry, you know, we, we have shooting practice going on. And I said, I, I know that you have shooting practice going on, but there are two roads and, you, you know, there's always one open. So you've got to have one open so we can, we can all get where we need to go. And he said, no, today they're both closed. You're just going to have to go back. And, um, you know, I paused for a minute and then I just looked him in the eye and I said, you know, haven't you ever had anywhere you need to be? And, um, and it's, it's something about, you know, I just saw past his, his helmet, his M16 and his army gear and, and just connected with him at a personal level, as a human being. And, you know, he spoke perfect American English. I, I also asked him where he's from and he said California and I, I said, oh, my sister lives in San Jose and so, you know, here we are chatting about our our American connection, and and, then, and and it was then that I said, you know, haven't you ever had anywhere you need to be? And and he said, you know, just a minute. So um, he gets on his walkie-talkie, and then he's going over and speaking Hebrew to these other soldiers, and he comes back, and he says, okay, we're going to let you through. And I said, well, what do you mean let me through? And he said, we're going to let you through. And I said, well, I'm not, I'm not the only one who has somewhere to be. All these people behind me also have somewhere they need to be. And I said, if you're going to let me through, you need to let everyone through. And, and he said, well, he just almost like, you know, how dare I ask so much. <laughs> and, and anyway, and I, I said, I know, that you can, I know that you can open the road. You know, it's, it's just, you know, we all have somewhere we need to be. And there was more talking back and forth. And to make long story short, the soldiers that day did open the road and did allow all of us to pass through that checkpoint. So these, these are the kind of stories that give me hope, obviously living in that context, having to deal with those situations, knowing that if I were a Palestinian getting out of my car, that I might be shot, I might be arrested, I might disappear, I might be beaten at the side of the road. I mean, no one knows what would happen to me. But I was aware, at least I assumed I was aware, that I could um, take that risk and do that. Now, m some of you may have heard of a woman uh, by the name of Rachel Corey, who was not so lucky, and, and when she was, you know, run over by a bulldozer in Rafa, um, in, what was it, 2003, I think, 2003, um, you know, it really, that really shook me. You know, I got to meet her parents, and, and she was very courageous, you know, doing nonviolent actions to keep homes from being destroyed in Rafa at the border of Egypt and the Gaza Strip, and, and she was killed that day. And, you know, I think just in 2015, the Israeli government is still, you know, saying that it's not their fault and, and they have no um, responsibility for her death. So, um, so you know, I, I, I'm not always that bold, and, but that day, it, it just felt like that's what I need to do, and I took that risk, and, and fortunately for myself and others, it, it worked out. Um, so that gives you a little bit of sense of, of the kinds of things that I've experienced. Um, another, another story I want to tell is because, um, you know, things have changed. At one point, I could get a car with an Israeli plate, which were like yellow plates, and I could drive from the West Bank into Israel proper, as some people refer to it, or 1948 Palestine, or there are lots of ways of referring. Um, Israel still has no declared borders, so it's, you know, it's, you can't just call things always what they are. It's confusing. But I could drive. You can't now, but I could drive and just go and explore um, Palestinian areas or just the, you know, the, the whole country. I just wanted to see, you know, what was there. Go to the sea, go to uh, historic sites. And as I was driving, you know, what, there was someone at the university who gave me a map of all the destroyed villages from 1948. And I got so I could just see them, you know. It, it, often, there's um, cactus growing because people, you know, people traditionally use that to mark their properties, and that stuff just grows out of control if it's not maintained, and you can't get rid of it either. If you try to burn it or dig it up, it just comes back. So those that that um, sabr, as it's called, and sabr in Arabic means patience, and so that um, it, it's it's a, has a lot of symbolic value for Palestinians that these cactus are growing where people used to live, and they're they're kind of like the the, the last sign that, that life was still there. Because most of these village sites are actually just still there. 
abandoned with destroyed homes. So it's not like Israelis moved onto them necessarily because they're hilly. And um, so anyway, I I one one day I drove into a, um, a a driveway off the road. I couldn't believe it because I saw the the cactus and I drove in and looked around and it just I could just feel that it that it felt like a place that once had been. And looked at my map and it. It was the village, I thought, maybe, of Andur. And, um, and sure enough, uh, as I was going to leave, I saw a family sitting under a tree having a picnic. And there was a woman with a headscarf, and I heard them speaking Arabic. So I, I just said, you know, what are you guys doing? What, are you, you know, what is this place? And they, they confirmed that it was actually their village. And they are one of the internally displaced Palestinians. So they live in a, their village was destroyed, they moved to another village, and they became Israeli citizens, and so they yearly come and do this picnic to kind of just remember where they came from. So um, these are some, some experiences that have just really touched me over the years. And um, obviously just being, as some of you know, and you can see Cynthia is such a gracious hostess, and just... You know, when you're in Palestine and you connect with Palestinians, there's just a, such a sense of hospitality and generosity. And I very quickly just fell in love with, you know, the, the, the openness and, the, and, and how, um, you know, how people would just share everything they had with us. So this is actually, um, you know, uh, me with Nasser's great aunt, who unfortunately passed away last December. But... We would always go to their house. Everyone wants to <clears throat> invite you for dinner, but we go to their house for breakfast because they bake the traditional tabun bread, which is built in a in, a, in an oven that never goes out, and they use the like the droppings from the goats, and and that's that's the fuel for the fire. And so you know, there's this whole ecosystem around the animals that you have and and how you use everything. And so we bake on stones, and and the bread is just. Incredible. So we eat breakfast at Auntie um, Simon's house. And uh, her daughters are still baking bread, so that's one of the few ovens that are still left. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's wonderful people, and if you see here, the, um, in 2000, you know, once the wall started being built in this area, which is uh, north of Janine, right at the Green Line, they built a fence, but they actually did end up building a partial wall. So this is actually on one of the holidays that we're visiting people, and you can see how close. This is the last house in Nasser's village, and all this land, you know, has been taken for the wall and the fence. And of course, that's like a double whammy, is that what they call it? Because in 1948, his father lost quite a bit of land. And I'll have a picture and show you how you can just have a view of that from the village. Um, you know, in spite of everything, you know, we celebrate life, birthdays. So just share a few personal photos with you. Um, here's a photo where you can see <coughs> the view from a hill near the village. And this is, this is on the northern part of the village. So here's the fence which then was, uh, I guess it was already a fence, you know, it's being built. So, and this is a, a village, there used to be three villages together that were um, kind of, that had the same school even, they shared. And so two are in Israel now and one in Jelama, which is not his village, is in the West Bank. And this is his brother looking out at his father's land, which is now behind the fence, since 1948. And the settlement that um, farms the land since that time. So how far away would you say that settlement is? I mean, it's, it's right there. <laughs> not, not far at all. I mean, it's literally like the, the village goes up to, you know, the village used to go, you know, these are, these are this whole region. This is the breadbasket of Palestine. It's called Marj Ibn Ahmad. And um, it's just, you know, all those lands were cultivated by these three villages. And so some of his family's property ended up, yeah, there was like an armistice agreement, and I think it was the King of Jordan who just did some swap and then gave that part to 
to Israel. So, and this this is the cactus that you see if you drive through Israel and see a Detroit village site. You can spot them very easily. I'm going to try to keep moving. So, I do want to um, read you a very short thing. So, I told you I'm a writer. I'm writing a memoir about my experiences in Palestine. So, before we get on to Canaan, um, I just want to give you a little taste. So, this is Canada Park near Jerusalem, and uh, in 1967, not 1948, the village of, of uh, Beit Nuba, Yalo, and Amwas were uh, destroyed by order of then General Rabin, and the, he wanted this, what they called a Jerusalem corridor. They didn't finish the job in 48, so they had to come back, and literally in 1967, which is, you know, it's in my lifetime, you know. So, and, and there was the, the new Jewish, the, the Jewish uh, fund in Canada raised money to establish this park and build, you know, plant trees and kind of erase the evidence. But you can still go to Yalo, and if you know it's there, and walk and kind of know that that was uh, someone's house. So I, I actually got to walk the, the path that people from Yalo had to, when they left in 67. And when I was uh, there one of, on one of my trips, and so we actually kind of walked in the footsteps of the people who had to leave. So most of the people from Yalo ended up in Ramallah, which is in the West Bank. And um, just to give you a little taste, it's very short, of what I wrote related to that um, experience, I think it might just to give you a little taste of, of what I'm writing. Hon Kandar City. This was my grandmother's house, she calls out, pointing to the rubble that backs up to clusters of fruit trees. She kneels down and pushes away some of the rocks with her bare hands. Some of the people brought small tools with them to dig and offer her a spade. But she keeps clearing rocks that were once the stone walls of her grandmother's house until she had made a small depression in the pile. Her eyes are wide open, her gaze focused on her hands. Suddenly her shoulders are still. I happen to be standing close to her and hear her gasp. I see her right hand reach down and pick up a triangular shard of white china with the remnants of a deep blue floral pattern. Hadman Sahun Sitti. This was my grandmother's china. Her eyes dart up at those of us standing around. Kunt I remember eating on them. She continues digging and finds a few more pieces and tucks them in her, into her pocket. Then she gets up and walks toward the back of the destroyed house. She bends over again and tugs at a piece of metal protruding out of the rubble. Ya Allah makinat el khayata. Oh my God, my grandmother's sewing machine. Now the tears flow freely down her smooth cheeks. Her dark eyes scrunched in heartache. The earth below will not surrender the machine. She runs her hands back and forth over the frame as if it's her grandmother's arm. Can it sit it chayet? Hona, on the shebek. My grandmother used to sit here, so here by the window. The woman's, the woman's image blurs as my own eyes pool up with tears. I take a sip of water, hoping to swallow the lump in my throat, but it remains stubborn. I look around, scanning for a neighbor's house next door, across the street. Piles of rubble is all I can see. So I just wanted to share that with you, because I walked with these people and say, oh, this was so-and-so's house, and this is where we used to pick, this was the well, and, you know, and, and just to follow that and then witness this younger woman who was there just as a child at her grandmother's house to re-experience um, what was left. So that was... Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that, that really um, remind me again and again that, you know, something went very wrong in this place, and we need to acknowledge what happened. And so that's part of, I think, what I continue to do in my life. And um, so that area was annexed. It became part of Israel, and um, you can go visit it. It's a tourist site, Canada Park.
So I want to I want to move us back where we were. So I was invited to speak um, in the at the Ben Gurion University in the Negev, which is in the Negev Desert in Israel, by a Bedouin professor. It was a, a conference on marginalization, marginalized communities, and um, but it was an international conference, so it was talking about marginalized communities all over. But uh, on the way there, it was just really eye-opening to to see in Israel. Israeli citizens who um, could not continue their way of life as Bedouins. So there's, I think there's like 40, what they're called unnamed, uh, uh, unrecognized villages that Israel is systematically destroying and um, building these townships for Bedouins. They want them to be sedentary. There are all kinds of laws about you can't graze animals, which of course destroys uh, a Bedouin way of life. So there are Bedouins still in the, in the West Bank who can live as Bedouins, but in Israel it's, it's a dying breed. And so there's some diehard Bedouins that are in outposts on, uh, out in the desert. And I'll show you just an interesting photo. Um, so this is, this is how they keep their animals now, because you're not allowed to like, have them out. Or, so they use part of, part of the land that they have in the township to, to still raise animals, but they have to actually buy feed. And who sells feed? <laughs> yeah. Israel. Um, you know, so they can't, they, it's not as self-sustaining as it once was. And of course they can't, um, you know, use the winter rains to, to grow lentils and have their own food sources. So the, the health uh, conditions of Bedouins is, is terrible. And in fact, uh, Ismail Abu Sa'ad's wife did her PhD on just that, to, to document um, what's happening to the health of the Bedouins because they're being forced to um, to be sedentary, but they have a lovely uh, uh, UN, like a you know welcoming house. They used to have a welcoming tent each each Bedouin family, and they still have their coffee always on the fire. So if you go visit someone, you still get a cup of uh, coffee. This is a couple pictures of the wall. This is uh, near Kalandia checkpoint in Jerusalem, and this is actually not too far from there as well. And for people who can't read that. Um, so this, yeah, let me tell you, this is one of my favorite ones. It says Control-Alt-Delete. Basically, you know on your computer, if you're computer savvy, if you ever have to restart or reset your whole computer, you press Control-Alt-Delete unless, yes. unless you have an Apple um, or a Mac. And, and someone painted that on the wall, you know, wishing we could just say Control-Alt-Delete and get rid of this wall. Um, you know, I've actually witnessed the wall going up. I was in um, that area. And um, unfortunately, not all of my pictures are electronic. But um, I, you know, I went from East Germany and, and lived to see the wall go down in '89, and only to see a new wall being built in um, in Palestine and Israel. So yes. What are we seeing in the background of the lower left picture? And here, it's it's just uh, like a privacy um, lattice thing. To be honest oh. with you, it's. It's kind of just a makeshift area for the animals. Um, so this is an example. Here's uh, this is Bedouins that are trying to just stay on the land. They're they're not really allowed to be there. The electrical lines run right over their heads. Of course, they have no electricity, no running water, and their water sources are have turned into state parks. You know, so you go to. Um, a state park that has a beautiful waterfall that used to be a water source for the Bedouins. So now they're, they either have to, <laughs> so they actually have to go take trucks and go haul water to where they're living to be able to stay there. Um, and, and this is just an example of the renaming of a place. So, you know, where's Palestine? Palestine is in Israel. Where's Israel? It's in Palestine. You know, what do you, what do, you do? Um, but what happens with the signs, the Israeli signs, instead of giving the genuine Arabic name of a place, which in this case the, the, the city in English we know is Be'er Sheva, which is from Hebrew, Be'er Sheva. In, in Arabic, they, they write Be'er Sheva in Arabic, but it's really Be'er Seba. So they, uh, they do the same in Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, they write they're, they'll phonetically write that in Arabic, and then, at least in Jerusalem, they write Al-Quds in Arabic in parentheses, which is the Arabic word. So I've seen that around Nablus in, in Hebrew, is called Shechem, and, um, which is a city in the West Bank, and 
And so they write Nablus in English, and they write um, Shechem in Hebrew, and then in Arabic letters they write Shechem, even though it's called Nablus in Arabic. So I've witnessed some of that renaming of places where um, obviously the destroyed villages, there's no sign saying somebody once lived here or giving the name of the, the town or village, um, except in places like Haifa and Jerusalem, of course. Um, I'm going to probably skip through this. My, I told you I was on a journey. Part of my journey through worrying about land and water led me last Thanksgiving to Standing Rock um, because of the connections in my mind to water. Also in Flint, Michigan, many of you may have heard, the water was contaminated, and so that was very close to home for me. And you see that some people have gone to Standing Rock. Detroit stands with Standing Rock. From Palestine to Standing Rock, we are united. It was, it was a very powerful experience for me, and I actually brought Canaan Fair Trade food and made three dishes during Thanksgiving for like over 500 people. Um, having had a restaurant, I could do that, but um, there's me cooking a, a pot of lentil soup. And um, anyway, it was just a, a marvelous experience of seeing people who have a strong connection to land and who just want to live in their way of life and have access to clean water and, uh, and have their way of life protected. So these are just some photos from my trip there and I took part in a, in a women's silent march, or not march, prayerful uh, march to the bridge. It reminded me of when I walked up to the soldiers that day, um, that day when I was trying to get to work and we basically walked um, Native women, surrounded Native women and escorted them to the, to the bridge in silence and locked arms and, and in that day too, you know, a week before, if you may have heard, the, the water cannons were being shot at, at protesters and it was, it was um, you know, below zero, so 300 people had hypothermia and, and so just a week later we, we did this and nobody got hurt and no fire, shots were fired and they opened the barricade actually for the native women to go pray at the river, which is what they wanted to do. <coughs> So it can be done. There's lots of hope out there. Um, but that's my connection to, to Standing Rock. So I really want to turn now to Kenan. Um, uh, you know, Nasser and I both did our PhDs in Madison and uh, through the fair trade coffee movement and general fair trade and, and Nasser's awareness back home that uh, olive, you know, farmers weren't getting anything for their olive oil. They were having to work as laborers in Israel. and um, And... You know, it just was, they couldn't even live as farmers. And so uh, he applied the idea of fair trade and recognized that people were already doing organic farming from way back and brought those two ideas together and established Canaan Fair Trade and the Palestine Fair Trade Association so that farmers in, in his area of Janine could collectively um, go back to work on their farms and, and earn a premium price for their products and then actually put a stamp on it that it's made in Palestine. So previously, uh, surplus olive oil was bought up by Israel. It was sold as, as an Israeli product. Sometimes farmers weren't even paid, or they were paid way late. But Canaan always pays the farmer a fair living wage, does a lot of, uh, always <coughs> reinvests in the community. And through the association, farmers are able, as you've read, to, to come together and actually live as farmers and, and live their way of life. And, What's, what's really special, uh, you know, this is not just farmers producing olive oil or the other things that they make, but it's, it's farmers passing on, you know, the longest history of, of agriculture in human history on to all of us. You know, the fact that by supporting Canaan and supporting Palestine in terms of people's way of life, you know, not us totally outside of politics, but just investing in people being able to live and the way they want to live on their land and that is something that is you know beyond the product you know this is investing in someone's life and in their livelihood and so through the project you know the price of olive oil has has increased it stayed whether you're part whether you're supplying olive oil that can unfair trade or not the whole area of olive country and I think 80% of farmers have olives, so it's, it's, it's really an important, and it's also a vital food source, you know, that if, if Palestinian farmers aren't taking care of their trees, 
then the area won't have olive oil, and that's like the bread and butter of the area. So it's, it's a food security issue, it's, it's a way of life issue, you know, these, these men were having to go as day laborers, what was happening to their families. Now everybody can be home and work together on their land as, um, and so, and this, this relationship between land and, uh, and, and the people there who live on it goes way back and it's, it's, it's like its own ecosystem. I mean, the food that you've tasted now, this is all pretty simple food. You know, it's, it's legumes and it's, you know, it's herbs and it's, you know, there's a lot of nuts and seeds and then they also do dairy with um, the goats and the sheep. But uh, it's, it's healthy, nutrient-dense food. And because of the push to go back to organic, which is what people always did before, you have and, and do intercropping, you know, where you're, where you're seeing, um, where you're planting, you're, you're enriching the soil and, and um, having the nutrients, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but basically you're creating food that is life-sustaining. And if I show you this picture of, so these are the products and one of the farmers that I'm sure you've read about, here's a, here's a man who can't get to his land, of course, along the fence or the wall. Um, farmers have either lost their land or they have restricted access to even care for their trees. So these are all the challenges that, you know, Kenan is working with and trying to overcome through the project. But if you look at this tree, this tree is between like two and 3,000 years old. This tree, how many people has that fed? How many years has that tree withstood the test of time that a farmer knows how to care for that tree and that tree will literally feed a community generation after generation. So that is a relationship of a farmer to the land. It's not just a product. And um, you see how when you plant other crops around the olive trees, that's how you get to have such rich, um, and you know, we're learning about that, right? I mean, in Wisconsin, they're just going to do that. They're going to do intercropping because, you know, the soil is richer, the food is, is more nutrient dense, and we're healthier and happier. But, you know, this is something that we already know how to do. This is our human uh, inheritance as, as people, you know, where people have done this and know how to do it and have done it. You know, they know how to have animals be part of that ecosystem as well. And so here you have Nasser with some farmers and they're admiring... I think these are almond trees with some legumes planted between, which protects the soil and enriches the soil and um, creates a great ecosystem. So um, I want to leave time for questions and everything, but you know, part of what also happens, the, some of these photos are from the Olive Harvest Festival. So you can all go to Palestine. You can go visit Nasser. <laughs> You can, you can pick olives, you can join the festivities, and these are friends of mine from, she and I studied in Freiburg together on my junior year abroad. She went with her husband and her kids and took part in the week-long festi festivities in, um, in, the, in the area and got to go to the, the parties and see Dubka, traditional music, and, and visit the factory, and this is Nasser at one of the trade shows. So, there's a lot going on, and I think, you know, a couple thousand people come every year and take part in this. You could be one of them. You know, you don't, there's nothing to be afraid of. If you go there, you're, you're good. <laughs> They'll take care of you. So, um, anyway, so it's, it's really an exchange. So this goes beyond. It's Palestinian farmers knowing there's people like you and me out there who, who recognize the value of what they do who don't just read the headlines, who know that these people produce something that has value, ancient value, life-sustaining value to all of us. And so they get to know that, and then we also get to know that Palestine is more than a headline. It's, it's life, it's livelihood, and it's, and it's, it's beautiful. So it's, it's really an incredible um, thing to have been a part of, and I, it's, it's as much a natural part of, I think, his journey as it has been mine. Um, obviously, looking forward, we always have this talk of, you know, this is all the stuff that you can read about, like, you know, peace and security and how are the borders going to be and settlements. And I told one of you that I'm a pessimistic optimist. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 
of course, the, I, the, all of this history and, and reality weighs heavily on me each and every day, and my children grow up with the burden of being Palestinian. But at the same time, you know, when I, when I, my lens is dignity. And whether it's in Detroit, you know, with, with racial tension, whether it's in Standing Rock with the Native Americans, whether it's in Flint, Michigan with water, whether it's, um, you know, wherever it is, or in Palestine, you know, if you use the lens of dignity, you get past all these political things that, you know, that we argue about and keep us from c coming together. And so I encourage you, you know, whatever you learn, whatever you get out of this class or, or what you read, to reach out to someone who you might not agree with, because you'd be surprised. It's, it's up to each, each and every one of us to come together and see the dignity in each other. And until we learn how to do that, we're as divisive as anything we see on TV. So um, that's the lens that I, that I live by and look through, and that's the lens that gives me hope. It's the lens that allowed me to talk to a soldier and get through that day or to get the, um, you know, the, the riot police in Standing Rock to open the road. In, in that case, it, it can be done, and it's, it's about recognizing each other's humanity. So I, um, I'm going to just open it up to questions because I'm sure that I've thrown a lot at you, and I would really like to hear from all of you as well. Um, that's a farmer and his lovely little girl that all of us are, can't keep our eyes off of with her beautiful blue eyes. Um, and I just encourage you to have questions. And just a final note, Nasser and I continue to work together. We're no longer together, but you know, he was just in Madison and you know, we work together, our, we share children together. His whole family is still my family, and it's been a wonderful journey for both of us. And um, we're just each continuing to do what we need to do 